thank you, uh, everyone. Um, my name is Dan Kalaji. I don't know if you can see me on the video or not. I can see Marty. So anyways, I am president of the Round Lake Property Owners uh, Association. I have been for the past uh, 10 years or so. And I'd like to welcome you all to this meeting today. Thank you for participating. Uh, it's very important that, that our members uh, are aware are, and are active in our association. So thank you for taking the time. Uh, as far as Zoom logistics goes, please mute your microphone and turn off your camera to ma maximize Zoom performance. Uh, we will be monitoring the Zoom chat box. So if you have questions during the presentation, please type those into the chat box and I'm going to be monitoring that and I will try to address your questions uh, as they come in. If there is something that I shouldn't be able to answer, we may have to wait until the uh, end of that segment for the presentation or till the end of the meeting. And then we will also have a question and answer session at the uh, uh, end of this presentation. And that would give you an opportunity to ask your question uh, verbally uh, because maybe it's perhaps complicated or, or requires some context. Uh, that couldn't be provided in the uh, chat box. So uh, if you have questions like that, please uh, wait for those until the end, and then we will ask you to uh, uh, ask your question and we will answer it. Um, so our agenda, uh, call to order, as I mentioned, uh, uh, my name is Dan Kalaji. We're gonna talk about the board of directors election that took place. Marty will talk about the financials. And then we have our individual committee chair that will talk about our five uh, primary committees and activities that we um, uh, participate or promote uh, via the association. And then uh, have the question and answer session after that. So uh, that's our agenda. I hope to be out of here uh, within uh, you know, 90 minutes or maybe two hours at the most. I'm cognizant of everybody's time and these meetings can get a little long. So I'm gonna move it along should we get uh, to a point where we get stuck or you know, in a, a discussion that uh, requires more time than we can permit at this meeting. So with that, I'm going to move to the uh, Round Lake uh, Board of Directors election. Uh, this year, Marty Hansen, Jim Nanskeville and David Rutt uh, we're up for election. Uh, their terms expire at this meeting, and uh, they've all been on the board, Marty, since 2016, and both uh, Jim and Dave uh, joined the board in 2019. The other people you see in this list are the other members of the board, and uh, their terms expire as shown on this uh, <clears throat> table. And uh, so next year, we will have three uh, uh, board members also uh, coming up for re-election. And we'll have the same election process uh, next year uh, that we did this year, uh, I would assume. So with that, with that uh, Marty, please switch and I will uh, talk about the election. So the procedure was a, a hybrid uh, election uh, in the sense that uh, for members that have a valid email address on file with us, we used an electronic uh, voting app to have you guys uh, vote for uh, individual candidates. And then there, were, there are about 18 or 19 members that do not have an email address. And so for those, we sent out a paper ballot uh, with the uh, uh, resumes of each of the candidates, and then they were to fill out a paper ballot and send it back to us uh, at the uh, association. So we had uh, 146 uh, respondents to the e-ballot, and then three respondents uh, via paper. So our participation uh, was about 36% of our total membership, which looks to be 411. Uh, a minimum quorum for this meeting is 15%. So or a minimum, well, and a minimum quorum to have a vote by the membership is 15%. So because we were, uh, had a 36% um, return rate, uh, we were far exceeded our minimum requirement and the vote is considered valid. Uh, 
Um, so the four directors are uh, shown here. Uh, the three incumbents, Marty Hansen on the left, Jim Nanskeville, followed by David Rutt, and then Jeffrey Ederman was a new candidate this year. The other three were incumbents. And as you can see by the election, the uh, incumbents uh, all had um, positive uh, ratings about, about 90, well, 89% or above. And uh, so due to the election, uh, the Marty Hansen, Jim Nanskeville, and David Rutt are once again uh, elected to the board of directors for a three-year term. And I wanna thank uh, Jeffrey Ederman for also uh, putting his hat in the ring. I really appreciate uh, that Jeffrey stood up and uh, wanted to participate. Uh, I don't think it's uncommon that uh, incumbents uh, win elections like this. So I don't think it's any reflection on Jeff at all. I think he would have been a great member in addition to the board. And I suspect we will see him on, a, uh, on the board in the future as some of the current members uh, roll off the board. So Jeff, uh, thank you for your consideration. And we look forward to working with you in the future. Um, any questions or anything with regard to the election? Uh, just type those into the um, uh, into the uh, chat box if you should have a question. Now I'd like to take a moment uh, to talk about our committee chairs and and who runs our committee. Uh, so we have several different committees. Uh, Carol Kalaji. Uh, who is my wife. She runs the membership committee and uh, manages the database and the membership outreach. Uh, as noted uh, with the asterisk, she's a volunteer. She is not a member of the board. And uh, our webmaster is Ruth Pauly, and she is not a member of the board, but a volunteer and active member. And I really appreciate what they do uh, to help <laughs> the board of directors uh, provide uh, the web services and manage our membership. Both of those are uh, significant tasks and we really applaud our, our volunteers for helping us out. Uh, next, I'd like to, um, oop, not, not that next, Marty. I just wanted to go through the list a little bit, sorry. Um, Jim Nanskeville and David Rutt are co-chairs of the Invasive Species Committee. Uh, that committee uh, basically works with the DNR and private vendors to manage our milfoil treatment uh, control activities. Don Westerning is safety. Uh, so he's in charge of the buoys that we uh, install and maintain uh, throughout the summer to keep our travel safe on the lake. Joan Burley is our social committee chair. Uh, she's been handcuffed by COVID here, but uh, she's still very social and is trying to come up with events uh, to get our our members uh, together and interactive. And we hope in the future, we can once again, get back to face-to-face to -face type uh, social activities. Following that is uh, Kevin Bushnick, uh, who does our fisheries management and does a lot of survey and investigative work uh, with regard to fish and the environment on the lake. And then John Kronoff, uh, he is our water quality chair. Uh, and he is charged with uh, performing activities and, and looking at uh, technologies that we can use to uh, make sure our water uh, stays clean <clears throat> so that we um, reduce the potential of uh, aquatic invasive species uh, entering or leaving our lake. Because with Round Lake having milfoil, we're actually more likely to spread milfoil to other lakes than other boaters bringing uh, milfoil into uh, Round Lake because we already have it. So that's kind of a brief summary of what they do. And now we can go to the next page, Marty. Dan, thanks. Before we go to that next page, uh, Michael Ablin has raised his hand. I'm gonna ask him to unmute. I think he has a question. Go ahead. Is the reservation represented on the board? Um, the reservation is not represented on the board, uh, but they are actively involved with any of the environmental decisions that are made, uh, specifically with the aquatic invasive species. 
Um, so they, their leadership in that area, their conservation department is, um, uh, is actively involved with our association activities, but we do not have a, a representative on the board that is a resident of the tribe. Okay, thank you for that question. We'll move on. Again, we'll have uh, more opportunities for questions at the end of uh, the formal agenda. Uh, I'm charged with uh, three things here, financials, membership, and website. Um, so rather than a lot of numbers, I have a lot of charts uh, that we're gonna go through. I'll try and go through them quickly. Uh, first is the revenue history for the organization going back to 2014. Uh, note for all these slides, the data is going to be current through September 13th, uh, but we've had very few financial transactions since then, uh, and the month just closed uh, yesterday. We have basically uh, four primary revenue sources. Uh, we'll categorize them as the membership dues, the $35 annual due. Uh, we also solicit AIS donations, uh, which are voluntary. And every year so far, we have applied and received at least some funding from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resource in the terms of grants. And then our catch-all category of other, uh, probably the biggest account there is our newsletter advertising uh, for our annual spring newsletter. Um, we solicit advertising that generally covers the cost of that production and mailing. You'll notice the 2019 spike, uh, that includes a special funding initiative that was uh, organized in as a GoFundMe uh, event in Hinton Bay for a uh, milfoil breakout there. So that's the anomaly in 2019. Note that the AIS contributions seem to fluctuate a little bit, uh, and Jim and Dave will talk a little bit more about that uh, later on in the agenda here. Revenue for 2022 looks like we're in trouble, uh, but that's really not the case. December is often our top producing revenue month. Uh, that's because December is our renewal month uh, where everyone will get a notice and uh, asking them to renew for 2023. So that's not reflected yet in this chart. Uh, also, we see a uptick in year end charitable contributions to the AIS fund. And the grant money fluctuations, um, they uh, are kind of based on what we can uh, or what we are awarded from the DNR and what we apply for. This slide is total dues subscriptions by year. Uh, if I, as members, you know that we can uh, or you can renew for one year, two years, or three years. Um, so this those dues can be paid in uh, one year that's not representative of the subscription year. For example, you will likely pay your 2023 dues during the renewal period in December, but that revenue actually gets recorded in 2022. So this slide shows the total dues for the membership subscribed to no matter when the dues were paid. It gives us kind of a better picture of, of how the dues or how the membership is fluctuating year to year. Um, statistically, there is a small decline uh, starting in 2019 that probably might have been somewhat influenced by COVID, but uh, we're still uh, having a pretty good participation rate. The 2023 and 2024 bars being small, those just represent the people that have paid in advance for a two-year or a three-year renewal. Our AIS donation history, uh, this slide shows two things. The green line is representative to the left axis, and that's the average donation that we receive. And you can see that that is bouncing around between 80 and $90 in the last couple of years. The blue bar is the number of donations uh, that come in in each of those years. The uh, 2021 has an asterisk. Uh, we exclude a one-time donation of uh, just over $5,000. Uh, one of our members, Sherman Black, 
uh, contributed shares of Google stock to us in 2021, which we sold and uh, deposited the cash as proceeds. I know we wish the market was doing better, but uh, just as a reminder, we do accept uh, stock donations and there can be an advantage to you in that uh, you do not have to pay capital gains uh, on that donation. Uh, if you are interested in a stock donation, contact me and I'd be happy to uh, help you through that process. Where is a little bit concern on AIS, AIS donations every year, uh, you can see that the number of donations seems to be declining, but the average uh, donation isn't declining similarly. Uh, basically, that means that although we're collecting fewer donations in terms of transactions, the average donations uh, or the donations have been a little bit higher. So we have worked hard to keep our dues at $35 per year, and we ask all members to consider adding something to that payment as an AIS donation. You can also donate to AIS as part of your renewal or you can donate that at any time during the year through the website or through the mailbox. Uh, we do have one member that's doing a uh, payroll deduction program through their uh, charitable giving uh, at their company. So we'll receive a monthly check uh, from that uh, process as well. Taking a look at the expense side, uh, our major expenses include uh, AIS, which would include management plans, surveys, chemical treatment, DASH treatments, and uh, Jim and Dave will talk more about uh, what we do with that money uh, in a future slide here. Uh, in the other category, again, that's another catch-all. Uh, typically, our expenses there would be postage and printing for the newsletter, bank fees for PayPal collections. Uh, although we have reduced our PayPal bank fees, uh, we now are officially uh, a nonprofit with PayPal, which gives us a little break on their transaction expenses. Uh, and just to note that uh, the board uh, has a process where any of the major expense items are always approved at one of our monthly meetings. And last slide for financials, this is just a uh, balance sheet showing uh, the cash accounts that we hold. Uh, you notice the Wells Fargo brokerage account um, or there's just a penny there just to keep it active. Um, that's where the stock donation would go. And by board policy, as soon as we receive a stock donation at the earliest opportunity, we convert that to cash, uh, given that uh, we don't consider ourselves as stock market gurus. So uh, we take that donation and convert it to cash as soon as practical. Uh, are there any questions that you'd like me to address, Dan, uh, on the financial report in the chat? Okay, we'll move on now to the membership part of the agenda. Here's a slide showing membership history going back to 2007. We seem to be kind of stuck at about 60% of property owners are active members. Uh, we, we've tried various ways of trying to push that forward. Uh, we basically uh, have kind of resolved ourselves that we need more word of mouth to grow. So we're asking you, and I know we have a small subset here, but be sure to talk to your neighbors. Ask them if they're a member and encourage them to join. If they're not, uh, we'd be happy to talk to uh, any of the board members. would be happy to talk to prospective uh, members and uh, get them on board and tell them what we do and what the advantages are. Again, we've kept our dues at $35, but we do ask for that. Uh, additional consideration of an AIS contribution. You can always check your online, or your membership status online. If you need a username, you can send an email to membership at roundlakes.org. That's monitored by Carol, uh, who runs our membership software for us. Uh, and if you don't have a password, you can reset your password by yourself uh, just by clicking the forgot password option there. Uh, we do have a website, uh, and uh, that's where uh, it's run as part of our membership uh, software. All riparian owners are included. Carol gets an update of property transactions once or twice a year and then updates uh, our database. So if you are an owner and you've just bought property, you're in our database, but you 
uh, may not be a member until you contact us and get um, your membership dues paid. We do have the option for multiple emails per or uh, people. So if you'd like your relatives or children to get our communications, um, we can add them to your membership profile. And we do have a Facebook page. We use that primarily to point people to the website, which is our primary method of communication. I'd like to issue a special thanks to Ruth Polly. I know she's uh, in the meeting today. She's our webmaster, um, does a very good job of keeping the website up to date. Uh, if you haven't been there, take a look. There's uh, some interesting things. We also have a lost and found uh, section there for things that may go missing on the lake or may float away accidentally. Uh, and we also have uh, basically a for sale or a uh, mini's Craigslist type thing. If you have something that uh, you'd like to offer for sale, uh, contact Ruth at webmaster at roundlakes.org and she can get that posted. You can have text or pictures uh, and she'll uh, take care of that. Thank you, Ruth. Website coming attractions. Uh, we did uh, solicit and procured some new water level monitoring equipment this year. Um, uh, the, uh, as you know, supply chain issues, we didn't get it as quickly as we thought, so it has not been installed. We're going to install it next year. Uh, it's going to be a continuous reading and direct readout, and we're going to try and get some software so that will automatically update on the website so people can watch uh, the fluctuations of water level. We have been taking uh, intermediate uh, water level readings at the County B Bridge, so we do have a record for this year. Uh, for at least one reading per week. Uh, but uh, again, we think this uh, new equipment will be a definite asset to the organization. Uh, we've also uh, looking at uh, adding a webcam to a, a view of the lake. Uh, we've purchased the equipment and tested it. Uh, the camera is a wise camera. This is it right here, if you can see. Uh, it's probably two inches by two inches. Uh, very small, connects via Wi-Fi, but it does need uh, AC power uh, to or to uh, run it. And we are looking for a place on the lake where we could install this. Uh, unfortunately, my Wi-Fi doesn't extend to the beach, so I can't put it on my site. But if you have a good view of the lake, uh, a strong internet connection and Wi-Fi and a power connection on a post or a corner or somewhere, a tree even, um, and would like, would not mind having this uh, on your property pointed at the lake, uh, contact me at treasurer at roundlakes.org and, and we can talk about the specifics of how that might work. Uh, we'd, we'd really like to have a, a view of the big lake, uh, maybe the sun sets or the sun rises, uh, or at least to get a, a gauge on what's uh, happening on the lake. The uh, website also has a link to Amazon Smile, which is a program where Amazon will donate to Round Lake property owners based on purchases that you make at Amazon. Um, to establish that, just log on to smile.amazon.com, and then you can select a charitable organization, uh, roundlakes.org, or a charity of your choice. It does not increase the price of the, what you're purchasing. Uh, it's just a way for Amazon to direct uh, their uh, contributions. Uh, so far, we've got uh, close to $200 from Amazon uh, purchases that have been uh, donated. And then just another reference that we do accept stock donations as well. At this time, I'd like to have uh, Kevin unmute and turn his there camera the, on. The committee things are coming. Um, so, Kevin, uh, Zoom stage is yours. All right, I'm going to do a screen share here. You see that, Marty? Yes, it's coming up. Okay, there we go. All right, so my name is Kevin Bushnick. I am a chair over fisheries, do a lot of lake research, work with the DNR, work with the um, vegetation biologists that we hire for our milfoil studies. I also run the kids fishing event on Father's Day weekend. So very involved, I live on the lake full time, uh, very involved with uh, anything related to fishing. 
Uh, I had Ranger Boats custom built me this boat just to research around lakes. So I have uh, a number of different technologies, depth finders, side imaging, pan optics, aqua views, underwater, you know, all the stuff that you need. If it's on the bottom of Round Lake, uh, I've probably seen it. And that includes toilets and box spring mattresses and tubs and airplanes and boats. So uh, if you want me to find something, let me know. Uh, I'm going to zip through a few slides here pretty quickly. So some of the things I was wrong about uh, when I started about doing this about five years ago is that the lake is loaded with northern pike and, you know, we need to get rid of them. That's not true. There's a lot less than I thought. Uh, the perch population, while they're not as big as they were 30, 40 years ago, um, it's definitely coming back. They're getting bigger. We have a lot of perch, a lot of schools of, of perch. Uh, the walleye population is diminished. That's actually not true. Um, there's a lot of uh, walleye in this lake, and I see them every day, all day long. There's a lot of them in the 16 to 20 inch range, which is the uh, um, a good range for eater walleye. Uh, the larger ones are a little bit more rare, um, and I would encourage anyone who, even though you can take one, uh, take one out of the lake, uh, a creel with your creel, it's uh, probably a good idea. The larger walleyes are females. And if, unless you're absolutely starving, uh, maybe you could throw those ones that are 25 inches and bigger back. Uh, muskies generally do not eat walleye, although I'm sure they will. Um, they eat our white suckers and we have a tremendous population of those. And the other uh, myth is that walleyes are always on the bottom at night. They're not, they're all over the lake, especially near the milfoil patches. And that includes in peak summer when the sun is out. So they're just not eating, they're hard to catch. Uh, milfoil is bad for fishing, that's wrong. Uh, there's a lot of fish and I think it's been, even though there's a lot of problems with, with the milfoil and we've uh, treated many of the areas and it seems to be getting better, um, it's still good for the fishery. So we all know this lake is beautiful. Uh, we need to protect it. It's a big lake, but it's not that big, right? If you, any lake can be fished out, including round lake. So we try to monitor all the species carefully. Um, some of the things that are on the bottom of the lake, uh, I'm gonna go through some pictures here. It's kind of cool. Uh, these are the old log structure cribs uh, in the form of a box. Most of them have been uh, broken up over the years. Uh, and are just, you know, there's logs laying all over the bottom, but there is a, a probably about 20 of them that I found that are still intact. They're in a little bit deeper of water and in some uh, rather odd places that are not typically fished. Uh, but that's what they look like when they get broken up. Uh, this is still, uh, you know, very good habitat for the fish. Uh, I don't really think it makes much of a difference whether they're in a form of a square or not. Uh, I think they, you know, the fish still... Uh, gravitate towards them just as well. These are just some examples of the cribs that were put in. I think uh, Al Reinemann uh, made these. He put a lot of the cribs in in very strategic places, um, did a really good job doing it. These are pallets with a little space in between for the fish to hide. Uh, these are also palletized cribs. Uh, this picture again was taken in the middle of the day. They're in the shape of a pyramid and uh, or a, a V triangle and uh, you can see there's walleye swimming around them. So this was in 78 degree water. Again, sun's shining overhead and the walleyes are all over the place. There's very few of these. I call these uh, the pyramid cribs uh, as well. I think there's about a dozen of them. They're very heavy, they're very uh, well built. And uh, these also hold a lot of fish. And then these are our famous septic tank cribs. Uh, they, they could also be used for sewage corners. Uh, Streets and Sanitation uses these things too for, for sewage. So um, I started out, I found a few of these and over the last two years I've uh, found up, I think I got my count up to 42. Good fishing around them, uh, good bass fishing, pan fishing. Uh, so if you can find these, uh, definitely fish around them. There's, there's a lot going on there. Uh, in the springtime, it's really important. These, this is a musky pair and they're always out uh, in early spring and doing the thing that they do uh, to make little muskies. So uh, I would encourage everyone to just leave the fish be during these spawning periods when the temperatures rise. And this is a critical part 
of the ecosystem to keep our fisheries healthy, and that in includes muskies, walleye, northern. Uh, it's just, just a quick pick, it's a little blurry, sorry, but a quick pick of all the perch schools. I see these all the time, tens of thousands of perch moving in and out of uh, deep water. So um, the perch are definitely coming back. I'm gonna go through um, a map here real quick. This is a typical map that you can find in, in any bait shop uh, in Hayward. I'm gonna zoom in on a few spots that I like for fishing. I have them highlighted. Uh, in white, uh, I mean, these are no secrets. Richardson's Bay out in the middle is, is fairly well for multi-species fishing. Uh, there's really good habitat there. There's some depth, there's weeds, there's sand. So it kind of has a makeup of everything we need. Dugan's Bar back in Blue Island Bay, other good fishing spots, depending on the time of year. Uh, a lot of the old time fishermen know these spots and they, they continually produce fish. Schoolhouse Bay is really good, not only approaching the inlet, but on the inside track there. We, uh, When I need to catch a kid a fish, I take him here, and generally there's at least one, one bass as a taker, so it's a pretty good place, and it's relatively protected if the winds are higher. Pretty good um, place to take the kids. Uh, finger Bar is very good. Um, has a large flat, has some sand, kind of has all the makeup of what you would need for a good fishing spot and good habitat. Also back in Fisherman's Bay, there's some of those old uh, log cribs down there and um, they're pretty easy to find if you have a fairly good depth finder. And Sandy Bar, of course, sticks way out in the lake. Uh, it's fished uh, pretty heavily, but it just continually produces fish. They they move in and out of that bar at different times of year and different water temperatures. So uh, it's a pretty good bet if you fish there that uh, that you'll get something. So this is one of the bigger catches this year as one of the granddaughters that lives on the lake. Uh, that's a six pound smallmouth. She caught that all by herself. Um, so pretty impressive, beautiful fish, lots of lots of color. Here's a few more of the other fish. Uh, the one on the left is a uh, tiger musky. Um, and that's the one on the right's a, a large northern pike. There's actually a, a fair number of the very large northern pike. And when I say large, I mean probably 20 pounds or more. Important to throw those back, not the best eating. And if you catch a tiger muskie, definitely uh, throw it back. They're just spectacular fish. And coming out of this water, they're um, you know, world-class colors. So another big northern out in the middle of the lake. And uh, occasionally you'll catch a big muskie like this. This one was caught through the ice a couple of years ago. So that's a 50 inch fish uh, native. You can tell by the colors, just beautiful. And that went back in the lake, by the way. So my top fishing tips are, uh, you know, use technology, use these depth finders. Um, they just uh, continue to improve uh, as time goes on. Every one of the vendors comes out with new cool stuff, pretty exciting. Uh, watch the weather fronts. Uh, it's really tough, to, you know, new, a new moon and a cold front and high winds. Uh, I always suggest to just go take a nap because it's almost impossible to catch anything. Uh, and practice catch and release, especially for the walleye. Um, the slot limit from 16 to 20 inches is good. I think you can keep four or five of those. Those are the best eating and we probably have the most population of those. Um, follow the lunar periods, very important. Full moons are usually best. Um, there's all kinds of apps out there that you can download to uh, help your fishing, including um, weather apps that uh, will help you get off the water as uh, the fronts approach. Uh, and there's some of the fishing apps that I like. One of them is called Fish Smart by Hum and Bird. It really gives you detailed uh, maps of the lake. Uh, and then my last slide here, um, you know, fishermen, uh, this is a multifaceted lake. So you have a lot of recreational boating, water skiers, jet skiers, you know, the fishermen always complain that uh, they're getting too close to them. And sometimes they do, but I would also encourage the fishermen that, you know, after 9, 30, 10 o'clock in the morning, fishing ain't that great anyway, go inside, have a, a nice lunch and uh, come back much later in the day and just try to be respectful of uh, each side of this equation. So that's all I have. I'm going to stop my share and go to the chat room. Yep, there are a couple of questions for you. Uh, let's see what we got. 
How can we discourage targeting smallmouth bass on their beds? So yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, they, the bass tournament fishermen get a lot of heat for that because they hold these tournaments in the spring. Uh, generally speaking, uh, you know, it's just, it's a sportsman thing. Uh, I don't personally target. Well, I don't really fish that much anymore, quite honestly. I just like looking at them. But, um, you know, I think the fishermen, the bass fishermen in particular, um, uh, they know that this is not the best time to pick the fish off their beds because who knows if they find their way back. I think they do generally. I think in general, bass fishermen res respect the fishery, but uh, that's, that's a really good question. I would tell everyone to just during the time of year when they're spawning, uh, might not, you know, just let them do their thing. Wait till the water warms up enough and they're off their beds and then, then go chase them. They're still in shallow water at that point. Um, I don't, Marty, there's a question. Can I share this deck? Uh, I guess we could, let me just go through it one more time and maybe we could post some variation of it out on the website. Kevin, we are recording the whole meeting, so the meeting will be posted on the website at some time soon, so people could easily okay, take great. a screenshot as well. Okay, great. That's all I got. Any more questions? Anyone? Kevin, there were a couple more questions in the chat. Um, uh, the first question was, has the increase of mystery snails had any impact on the fish population? So that's also a very good question. I've done a lot of research. They're Chinese banded mystery snails, I guess you could call them. Um, at first, we didn't think they had any predators, but if all of you who fish have noticed, the rock bass have gotten fairly large on Round Lake. And I've actually got video of the rock bass eating those snails, um, which is a good thing and explains why those rock bass are so big again. So um, I don't see them as a problem. I don't see the populations of those increasing. There's a lot of them in uh, on the sandy bars in shallower water, but I don't see them expanding. Um, but they are down there and I, you know, I've looked at the entire lake bottom, so I, I would not characterize them as a problem at this point. Uh the next question was, has the 18 inch minimum smallmouth bass bag limit of one had any impact on the bass size or numbers? Uh, I like that 18 inch limit myself. Uh, sometimes the, the bass tournament fishermen don't because that you might catch a four or five pound bass like I have on several occasions and it's only 17 inches. So you can't even register it in a fishing tournament. But I think it's a good, um, it's a good mark. Generally, when they start to approach 20 inches, 21 inches, they get up in that five, six pound category. And those are really fun to catch. And if a, if a youth get one of those on the line, it's a tremendous experience for them. So I think it's been a positive thing. I am seeing larger bass. So I think it's, it's having a good effect. There's a lot of small bass too, you know, in that two to three pound range, but I think it's a good thing. So there you go. And I'd just like to add a comment about this also is uh, the purpose of this regulation was to protect the large smallmouth bass uh, because uh, the fish community knows that there are trophy sized smallmouth bass in this lake. Uh, we were concerned that uh, people could come in and perhaps take, you know, three or four of these, you know, large fish. Uh, when they go out fishing and which would uh, deplete that population fairly quickly. So uh, the purpose of this restriction was to protect those large fat fish and maintain and improve our world-class smallmouth bass population. Yeah, and it, to add on to that, at the same time, they took the creel limit and size limit off of the largemouth uh, because they're obviously a competing species. So um, that combined, I think, makes uh, makes a smallmouth fishery that much better for Round Lake. Any other questions? These are good ones. All right, Marty, I'll turn it back over to uh, the master of the deck. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Uh, next on the agenda, I'd like to invite uh, Jim Nanskaville and Dave Rudd, our co-chairs of the AIS committee, to the Zoom stage. Please unmute and you can turn your cameras on. Jim and Dave. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. <clears throat> um, I'm Jim Nanskaville and Dave, I think you're out there somewhere, aren't you? All right. 
Um, I'd like to begin with this. Uh, this is just a couple photos for everyone, um, especially those that are new to the lake uh, or new to what is milfoil. This is a couple photos of uh, what those plants look like. On the left, it's a very uh, feathery, fine um, weed, and um, and it grows in more muddy, muckier, um, non-sandy uh, locations. And when those um, plants mature and get uh, out of control, they can surface, and they um, they look like the the uh, area the photo on the right where they. Um, they crown and they just are very invasive and, and cause these large mats of, uh, of weed that are difficult to navigate through. Uh, next slide. Dave, you got anything else to add there? No, I'll chime in. Okay. Um, every year we do a um, uh, fall uh, survey for uh, milfoil and we, Throughout the summer, we're taking locations um, that we have, uh, that we receive from residents on the lake. Um, our survey from last fall, well, we just finished our uh, most recent fall survey, but we haven't gotten the results yet. So um, we're showing um, numbers from, from last year, actually. So in 2021, we identified 76 locations in round and little round that had uh, 13.37 surface acres of uh, milfoil. Um, 34 of those acres were 0.15 acres or larger, um, which is over 6,500 square feet, just to put it in perspective of, you know, a pretty good size home. Um, this is the minimum um, size that we're able to use uh, chemicals and do do treatments on. We can we can do hand pulling or dash on smaller areas, but the DNR um, has restrictions um, on uh, on what exactly we can treat, and it has to do with not only size, but um, is it uh, is it um, obstructing access to uh, people's docks. Um, is it a, a nuisance for navigating around? Is it, uh, you know, in a swim area? So there's lots of strings that go along with what we can and cannot treat. Um, last year, we applied to the Wisconsin DNR to treat 20 sites in Round Lake. Um, and it was that, that represented just under nine acres of milfoil. The DNR denied some of our sites. They only allowed us to do 17 sites this past year, which represented about seven acres uh, for chemical treatment. And we used DASH. Uh, we did a quarter acre on Little Round. And that was two sites that kind of combined as one. And that took two days of, uh, of DASH to do that quarter acre treatment. Next slide. Um, speaking of those uh, surveys that we do, these are typical maps. Um, so our consultant um, that we that we hire to map all of the locations, she does these overall maps and then also zooms in on smaller, uh, tighter views of where milfoil is on the lake. And this is a map from last year's survey um, that shows all of the locations of milfoil, the yellow circles are showing what we what we treated with uh, with chemical and dash in uh, here in 2022. And as I mentioned, um, we just completed the survey, and we will have results probably in the next couple of weeks of, of that. Next slide. Um, we have found, uh, we did some testing based on some of our uh, milfoil that we pulled out last year. And um, our consultant sent some of the analysis to the University of uh, Montana State University. And they did some testing on what type of milfoil is in our lake. And they identified um, the areas that are um, starred 
on this map are called hybrid milfoil. So it's a Eurasian water milfoil, but it's a hybrid version. We don't know yet exactly what that means, um, whether it will respond any differently to our, our treatments or whether it grows faster or slower or you know is resistant to to any anything we're doing so we just wanted to make the uh, association aware that there's another hybrid of um, Eurasian water milfoil out there and uh, we will continue to keep our keep our eyes on it and um, and see how it how it reacts to the treatments that we do Next slide. Um, so as far as a history of um, um, water milfoil, we've been treating it for over 20 years here on the lake. So it's, it's one of our, um, as Marty mentioned, one of our largest expenditures and one of our most important activities that we do as an association is trying to keep a handle and control over, over milfoil on the lake. Um, in 2018-19, we identified almost 32 acres of milfoil, and we treated uh, just over 20 acres. In 2019-20, we identified 16.9 acres, plus there was an early spring outbreak um, of milfoil in Richardson Bay, um, and we ended up treating over 25 acres that, that year. In 2021, we had only five acres of milfoil found in our fall survey, and we treated 3.25 acres. And this past year, as I mentioned, 13.37 uh, acres at 34 locations were identified, and seven and a half were treated between chemical and, and DASH. Um, this is a table <clears throat> that gives you an idea of the historic cost of, um, of what we've been spending um, for the past few years on, on milfoil. Um, you can see that we have uh, total costs um, and then offsetting those total costs are some DNR grants. And um, DNR grants are becoming harder and harder to, to win. They're very competitive. Uh, the DNR is um, being Pretty, pretty strict on, on the monies they give out. Um, we used to do three-year grants with the DNR, and, and that might have been 2018, 2019 might have been the last year of a three-year grant, um, as I recall. And um, then we started doing one-year grants because we were told by the DNR that we will uh, have a much better chance of winning one-year grants over a three-year grant. So anything that's not covered uh, in the DNR grant is um, monies that we as an association need to come up with. And as I mentioned, the DNR money is getting tighter and tighter over time. And um, so we really rely on the membership to pony up and, and help us support um, keeping the property values high, keeping the mill foil down. Um, so. We, we really appreciate the, the monies that people are are donating. Anything else on that, Dave? No, I think uh, we have a pretty good system to try to keep track of what's going on, but we just need support financially to make sure we can keep doing this. Um, and also, I think it's important, Jim and I are available. Um, whenever people have questions, just give us a call or email and we're happy to come out and talk to you at your property or answer questions or whatever we can do. All right. Um, uh, and these, I should also mention that those costs <clears throat> include the survey um, and all of our mapping and, and all of the um, associated costs that go into um, maintaining the lake. So it's not just uh, chemical and dash and things like that. It's, it's a lot of other, other expenses as well. So, all right. <clears throat> so, so where does um, milfoil come from? You know, as I mentioned, it was brought into our lake um, many years ago. Um, but there are things that um, make the spread of it and increase um, milfoil, um, like human activities, such as shoreline development, 
and um, removing vegetation buffers, using fertilizers on lawns. Um, we know that there are some that have these products called AquaSweep products. And basically what these devices do is they attach to the leg of a, of a dock and they have a jet stream of water that cuts down the weeds and it disturbs all the, the mud and the beds and, and pulls things like milfoil up and it pushes them out into the lake and it just doesn't get rid of them. It just spreads to other areas of lake. So we've talked to those that we know have these um, products and have asked them not to use them. Um, some people have tried using um, lake rakes and pulling you know, weeds out that way. And um, that just basically breaks, again, it's, it's like mowing the, the weeds and, and, um, and it just breaks, breaks them and, and moves them around. Um, driving boats through um, milfoil is another major way of spreading. There's a lot of people that are driving through beds of milfoil that just are totally unaware that they're there. But if you see anything that's crowning or you see a very weedy area, we'd like to encourage you to, you know, you can fish it, but don't, um, don't be driving your boats through it and chopping it all up because you're just going to spread it around uh, other, other areas of the lake. And then there's um, weather events that have impact as well on our um, Eurasian water milfoil and, and other vegetation. So high rainfall can bring nutrients um, into the lake. Um, so again, we are asking property owners, uh, I know there's a lot of new building that's been going on on the lake. And as you go around and look at a lot of these new houses, they have these beautiful manicured suburban lawns and we know that they're dumping all kinds of chemical on those lawns and um, it's doing nothing for the health of our lake so we highly recommend that those property owners consider uh, a different a different way of uh, maintaining their their properties um, in fact Dave and I have talked about perhaps we will um, not be treating um, as a very high priority, those manicured homes that have Eurasian water milfoil because we believe they're part of the problem. So um, not that we're gonna do that, but we've talked about it and thrown it around because um, we, we really need to stop chemicals going into the lake and creating more nutrients. Uh, low water levels and droughts also expand the shallow waters, which enables more milfoil to grow um, climate change has a huge impact as well. So as we have shorter and milder winters, um, it's creating longer growth seasons for aquatic plants and um, milfoil likes light. And so we're, we're seeing it in deeper areas. Fortunately, we have nice clean water, clear lake. Um, it's it's uh, still a very healthy lake, but um, it does uh, allow more sunlight uh, into those those milfoil beds and they they can grow very quickly. Um, so as far as milfoil um, funding, uh, as we mentioned before, Wisconsin DNR gives us grants. Uh, we got a fourteen thousand two hundred grant in twenty twenty one. Membership contributions um, are are very much relied on. And in 2022 to date, we have a little over 9,000 that uh, has been donated. And our expenses to date uh, for 2022 management plan for um, doing the, we have to do a management plan in order to get permits from the DNR. That's been about $2,500 so far this year. Chemical treatment was 30,002. And Dash was a little over five thousand dollars for the Round to, to Round Lake location or Little Round locations. So the cost per acre, just comparison, if we're looking at chemical using chemical versus Dash um, per acre cost, we're looking at about forty seven hundred dollars uh, for chemical per acre, and it costs over almost twenty one thousand uh, dollars if we were to do a whole acre of dash. Um, so based on our, our quarter 
acre cost, uh, we're at about $2,121,000 per acre for, uh, for DASH. Okay, next slide. I think that was your last slide, Jim. Okay, all right. I'm not keeping track. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's it. Dan, do we have any questions to address for Jim or Dave? Um, I don't believe so. I have been answering the few questions that have came in because I've had the knowledge base to do that. Um, some people have uh, one question that came in was uh, talking about aquacide pellets uh, being allowed. So that would be a property owner uh, purchasing this pellet and applying it uh, around their you know, property and docks. Um, that is not allowed uh, per the DNR regulations. They would consider that a uh, chemical treatment application and it would uh, require you to uh, submit an application to the DNR and have it approved uh, prior to treating your uh, surrounding area with chemicals. Uh, so that was uh, the primary question. I don't know if Jim and Dave have any more to add uh, based on that. Well, speaking of the aquacide, I know that <clears throat> although you are supposed to get permit, I know that, that that's another thing that is being <clears throat> used from time to time, um, probably without permitting. So, um, you know, again, the, the DNR does require um, permits on that, but there's, you know, nothing that the association um, has control over um, as far as the use of that, that chemical. And all our work is sanctioned or approved by the DNR, both in our management plan uh, and in a permit before any of the dash or chemical treatments are done on the lake. Is that true? That's true. Yes, that's yeah. that's true. And maybe just to let the membership know, uh, in our lake management plan, we, we come up with a new plan, I think, every three to five years. And the DNR has input on that plan and you know approves it. Our current plan, the trigger level, uh, an area of milfoil has to get to 0.15 acres, as Jim had mentioned, to be treatable per our plan. Um, and that's kind of how we go into the season is we, we assess all these spots of milfoil. Um, and if they meet the criteria, not just size, but navigation issues, or, you know, there's a, a number of other things, then we'll apply to treat those areas. And this year we did that, um, everything over 0.15 acres, and that met the other criteria. This year, the DNR kind of out of left field said, well, we've decided that we don't want to treat anything smaller than half an acre. Um, so about three times what our trigger level is, which was approved by the DNR two, three years ago when we did our lake management plan. So we're at handcuffs this year. You know, we wanted to treat just under 10 acres. We could only treat seven acres because some of the sites were smaller than half an acre. And if you think about a, a half an acre is maybe hard to imagine. I mean, you can think of your yard as, as an acre or whatever, but if you had a half an acre in front of your property of straight milfoil um, running along the shoreline, that's that's concerning. And as a property owner myself, I've been involved with this for quite a few years now. Um, you know, that gets people kind of rattled when they see that much milfoil spreading and crowned and at the top of the lake. Um, you know, you kind of kind of have a little bit of a freak out thinking things are really going to be bad. Um, Fortunately, we're able to treat that milfoil and make it go away. But, you know, we're going to be going forward with this. You know, we're going to continue to monitor the lake, find areas of milfoil, apply for the permit, and we have to play by the rules at the DNR, and it's constantly changing. So going forward, as far as we know, next year, we're the, I think the size is going to be half an acre that we'll, we'll be able to treat. Fortunately, for example, in Richardson's Bay, there's a couple of spots where, you know, there's actually different um areas of milfoil but they're so they're so close together that we were able to tie those you know three or four areas together to create an, a size that was a treatable size of, of greater than half an acre so we'll try to be creative and you know and continue to treat milfoil so it doesn't get out of control but you know the stuff's never going away we're, we're we have a pretty good system to get to it annually um but right now we have one major chemical per cellicor that we're able to use and the size appears to be a half an acre or greater to be treatable. Um, 
So give a, you know, we're, we're going to continue to try to stay on top of this, which we have for 20 years, but it's going to, you know, there's good years and bad years. And, you know, so we'll just continue to communicate as we can with, with membership, but um, thanks. You know, one more thing, I think it's important for people to know that the process of treating chemicals is usually a two year process. So we identify like we identify things this fall, we can permit um, for next year. But if we find something in the spring and it hasn't been identified as a treatable uh, area, then we have to wait to the whole following next year um, to, to apply to treat that area. So unfortunately, it's, you know, there's just so many hoops that we need to jump through uh, to, to use product on the lake. And, um, and it just, it's kind of a long period. Like people see milfoil, you know, on the 4th of July in front of their cabin and call and say, well, why can't you come out and treat it? Well, it, that's not how it works, uh, unfortunately. So. But one, one additional feather in our cap, I think when we did a um, GoFundMe and raised a bunch of money, when Hinton Bay got out of control, but if we can come in, to, you know, if we have to go to the DNR every year and ask for funding, which we do to get grants and, they, you know, that's they that's worked. That funding is continuing to kind of get, you know, harder and harder to get the more money we can bring to the table as an association to be able to, you know, that's one less thing we have to deal with. If we have to go ask the DNR for money. Um, if we can come to the table as a membership and and have um, the funds to do some of this, that just it makes things even easier. So. I mean, we're going to try to encourage everybody on the lake to, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're here to do the job. Um, we need help financially to continue to do it as, as things develop. So we want to thank you in advance for consideration. Thanks, Jim and Dave. Uh, Michael, I do see your hand raised and a couple more questions came in the chat, but I want to move forward. Uh, can we ask you just to please save your questions to the Q&A at the end at this point? Thank you. Joan, I'd like to invite you to uh, turn your camera on, unmute, and uh, take over the Zoom stage for the social committee. Thanks, Joan. Thank you, Marty. Um, very interesting information about our AIS efforts. Um, dine around. We have not had dine around since the start of the COVID epidemic. Um, there's a group of people that have asked me about dine around. It may be time to start that up again. But in the meantime, I need some volunteers for our social committee or volunteers to host Dine Around. If you're interested in either of those um, activities, please contact me. On our website, my phone number is listed and my email address. So I really would love to have three or four new uh, additional members for our social committee. So since we weren't doing Dine Arounds, I took a little branch off into the educational realm. And two weeks ago, we hosted a educational seminar. We had three topics. Um, Dave Rutt, our AIS co-chair, presented on AIS updates. What have we been doing? And much of what he talked about in the seminar was on the Jim's presentation today. Then we had Patrick Goggin, UW Extension Lakes, and he spoke about shoreline conservation and best practices. Very good uh, presentation. And we finished up with Kevin Bushnick talking about fishing round lake. That was excellent as well. And Kevin covered a lot of that information today in our meeting. But I would like to encourage people to go online and watch the Healthy Lakes webinar. We've had excellent feedback. People really enjoyed it. Um, if you go to our website, the Round Lakes website, there's a link to watch our recorded seminar. So healthylakeswisconsin.com is the link to find out about the best practices. Uh, if you go to this link, you can. there are two places of particular interest the best practices site, and the Score My Shore. Score My Shore is an excellent tool to evaluate how your, your shoreline 
is evaluated uh, according to is is it keeping runoff away? Is it good shoreline habitat? This is confidential unless you want to register and keep your your uh, results up there. And then under best practices, you will find five projects that are relatively inexpensive, relatively easy to implement, and they address habitat and runoff um, going into your shoreline. Things that will lead to healthy lakes, better shoreline conservation, and healthier water, a healthier ecosystem for Round Lake. Um, under best practices, uh, next slide. There, there are five projects that they specifically talk about. First one is fish sticks that's aimed at improving habitat. The other four best practice projects are aimed at improving runoff or at preventing runoff and uh, cleaning water before it gets to our lake. One of those projects is that a native this amounts to a 350 square foot bed of native plantings that will slow the water down, filter the um, sediments and so forth out of the water and protect our shorelines. Can be a very attractive addition to your shoreline as well. Then there's diversion. If you have a path going down to your waterfront where the uh, water tends to find that path, taking sediment down in a rain, um, doing a diversion project to keep that sediment from entering the water. Rock infiltration is another project that captures runoff, maybe next to your driveway or under your roof so that runoff during a rain doesn't go immediately down to the lake. And then finally, a rain garden. That's good for both habitat and for capturing and cleaning runoff. Next slide, Marty. Okay, so these best practices are eligible for grants. Our board voted to be a sponsor for our property owners that would be interested in doing these best practice grants. We can get up to seven a year. There is much as $1,000 per grant. As I said, those projects are all relatively inexpensive. And the match for this is the DNR will pay 75% property percent. There are very specific requirements um, for each of these projects. There's a technical uh, sheet and there is an agreement that the homeowner has to sign saying that they'll finish this project within one to two years and they'll maintain it for 10 years. So you can't uh, take the money, uh, try, you know, say you try a rain garden and then you let it grow over with weeds. Um, that That isn't how this works. The DNR wants to know that you're going to maintain your project for a lifetime of 10 years or more. So we've already done the pre-application. I did that a couple of weeks ago. And the final grant application is due mid-November. So anybody that's interested in doing one of these five projects or even would like to know more about it or might be interested in a year should contact me by about October 10th so that we could do what needs to be done prior to the final grant application. So thank you, Marty. Um, do I have another slide? No, that was your last slide, Zoan. Okay, Zoan. then thank you. I just want to encourage people to go online and watch our seminar. If you go to our roundlakes.org website, a link where you can just click on it and watch that seminar. I've had, I think we've had about 23 or 25 people go on and watch it since the seminar was held. And we've had very good feedback. People are really um, pleased. It really links with everything because this is under that Healthy Lakes umbrella. There it is. Okay. So you can click on watch the video and um, watch our seminar at your convenience. I watched it again yesterday and picked up even more than what um, I did while it was going on. So if you're interested, give me a call. Please go online and watch it and try the Score Your Shore, Score My Shore 
evaluation tool that's there. Again, I'm looking for social committee volunteers or volunteers to host a dine around. Just give me a call or an email and I'd be really looking forward to hearing from you. Any questions from anyone? Any volunteers? <laughs> Hey, Dan, do we have any questions for Joan? Uh, no, not on the uh, chat room. I do see uh, Michael Alban has his hand up. You may want to uh, allow him to ask his question. Okay, Mike. Are you there, Mike? I think his question might have been have on, to on AIS. Mike's We'll take we'll take Michael when we get to the Q and A. Yeah, that's okay. fine. Q and A is fine. Thanks for your patience. Okay, our thank you, Joan. Again, if you uh, thank you this this meeting will be recorded and posted on the website within a day or two. So if you need to grab Joan's information or uh, just go to our website and you can contact Joan. Um, interesting grant opportunities if you want to do a project on your property. Our next agenda, agenda item was clean water and John Kronoff was our, or currently is our chairman and was gonna make this presentation. And we did hear from John uh, a couple days ago. John is down in Sarasota and uh, he's okay, but uh, he does not have any power. So he is not with us today. So I will just uh, pinch hit. Uh, we don't have a lot of information here. Uh, part of the clean water program was our clean boats, clean water program, where we hired inspectors at the boat launches to look at boat trailers, both coming in and coming out of the lake. Uh, we did not have that program this year. Um, the grant money is very hard to get, uh, but even harder is finding volunteers or paid volunteers that will uh, do this. So, uh, given that hardship, uh, we did not have a clean boats, clean water program uh, this year. We still uh, would like to have some emphasis in, in trying to maintain the quality of the water in Round Lake. So one of the things that we are looking at right now is something called uh, a camera that would be posted at the boat launches. And this camera would record boats going in and out and uh, also has a speaker that plays a message to remind uh, the boaters that they should inspect their trailer before they launch uh, their boat and uh, when it comes out so they don't have any weeds or other debris trailing uh, on their trailer as they move around to uh, another lake. Uh, so those were the two items that um, John was going to cover. Uh, next, we have a uh, water safety update from Don. Don, uh, if you could uh, unmute and turn your camera on, welcome to the Zoom stage. Hey, good morning and uh, good morning to all the members. Uh, Don Westering, it's my uh, first year on the committee and the board, and uh, it's, been a, it's been a great time, so I'm really enjoying it. Uh, been on the lake myself uh, as an owner for 11 years, but have been coming to Round Lake since uh, 1979 uh, with the family. So pretty familiar with the lake. Uh, I chair the Water Safety Committee, and I just want to give uh, the folks on uh, the Zoom meeting today a, a couple updates. The first one is buoys and navigational aids. Uh, we recently uh, applied and did get approval for three new buoys that will be uh, installed in the spring in Muskie Bay. Uh, they are designated as what we call slow no, no weight buoys. Uh, but just to be clear, those buoys are going to be located in what I would call the southwest corner of that bay. It does not include the entire bay. It's a portion of the bay where there's a small island. If uh, those of you are familiar with Muskie Bay, uh, there's some shallow water there and uh, working with the people in, in that corner of the lake, it was really determined that um, we needed to put some buoys there. So uh, uh, that'll happen next year. And again, all buoys are you know approved and permitted by the uh, Wisconsin DNR and the local townships with very, very specific uh, uh, GPS coordinates. So you'll look forward to seeing those next year. I also just wanted to mention that our buoys on the lake Next year, we'll have a total of 20. 
navigational buoys and channel markers on the lake. Uh, they are installed by a third party that we contract with. Uh, so myself and others in the past who are part of the board have gone out to help to ensure they get put in the right locations. Uh, and then we will make sure that they get taken out as late as we possibly can in the month of October um, and before the ice freezes up. And uh, again, just another great example of how your dues help cover the financial cost of maintaining all our buoys on the lake. The uh, next topic I just want to brief people on, and you may be aware of this if you read the news or read the local paper, we do have a new elevated wake ordinance for Round Lake, and that uh, went into effect this year. That was uh, put into effect, that ordinance, by the town of Hayward. And what that is, in essence, is a uh, uh, basically for any motorized boat, whether it's a pontoon boat, ski boat, wake boat, uh, anything with a, you know, much, people might use it for, you know, a boat that has a way of putting the ballast, putting water in your boat uh, for some of your recreational activities. If you're creating a wake more than 24 inches and a length of 50 feet, you must be operating in an area further than 700 feet from shore. And, uh, you know, I think uh, from what I've observed, most people are doing that. It's good uh, that they're doing that. These you know, large boats uh, certainly are a lot of fun, but at the same time can cause havoc on the, uh, the the lake itself. And I would just encourage people, if you really want to get kind of a picture of what that looks like, you can go to our website. And if you uh, go on there under boating, you will see there's a picture of Round Lake that will depict where the 700 foot designation is. So uh, take a look at that. And uh, again, just thank you to everyone who has these boats for operating them in a very safe manner. And the last uh, topic I want to just touch on is personal watercraft. And, you know, just a little caveat, it is probably one of the few areas where we do get some complaints on the lake. Uh, I've also talked to our conservation officer that covers uh, our lake from Sawyer County. And uh, we had a good conversation a couple of weeks back. Um, there is, a, you know, quite a few new jet skis on the lake. There's a lot of new homes, cabins. And, uh, you know, myself, uh, I'm a jet ski owner. I know we've got quite a few members on the board that own jet skis. And I would just ask that people, you know, remember that uh, when you're operating a jet ski, there are some requirements. And uh, the first one is you really need to operate based on the regulations uh, in the state. Your jet ski at a, what we call a slow no wake speed or a very slow speed. Anytime you're within 200 feet of shore or 100 feet from a dock. And that's probably, you know, one of the two biggest offenses we see. So again, you know, there's a lot of lake out there, you know, we're all trying to share it together. If you or your family member, or if you have, you know, children in your family uh, or grandchildren that operate these uh, personal watercrafts and jet skis, just, you know, have a conversation with them about being safe and just being respectful to people on the lake. And then last but not least, just a friendly reminder that jet skis, personal watercraft, can only be operated between sun up and sundown. Uh, obviously, we don't see a lot of them out early in the morning, but you know we do see quite a few, and we do get some calls, you know, from jet skis that are out on the lake past sunset. And you know, again, just a reminder to folks that the uh, DNR regulation is that these jet skis, your jet ski, my jet ski, must be off the lake at sunset. Uh, so if you could help us enforce that, that would be great. Uh, and just, you know, I guess my final comment would be just, you know, thank you to all the members for keeping our life safe. We did not have any major incidents that were reported last year, at least uh, through our law enforcement, uh, which is good. And, um, you know, I think, you know, if there's a lot of activity on the lake, even like some of the other people mentioned, like Kevin, you know, we got people fishing, we got canoeists, we've got, you know, wake boats out there. We've got people on wakeboards, and I think we just all have to come together to enjoy the lake and uh, be respectful. Uh, and that's it. Marty, are you there? You can see Marty, but I uh, I don't hear him. So don't Marty, hear him. I'm sorry, I did not unmute my microphone. Thank you, Don. 
Uh, we've moved to the Q&A section, which uh, Dan is going to moderate for us. Just a reminder that the chat box, hopefully all of you have found by now, uh, you can enter a question there or uh, activate the raise your hand icon and uh, we can recognize you and ask your question. I know Michael's been waiting patiently, so uh, we'll take Michael first. Thank you very much. Uh, very uh, well done seminar today. I want to thank you. Uh, thank everybody. I appreciate it very much. I did write up some questions if I should come back uh, to them later, uh, but I have four. Um, and uh, the uh, on the Eurasian milfoil and, uh, you know, chemicals in the lake issue, is it, and I don't do this and I won't, but is it acceptable to use organic fertilizer on your lakefront lawn? Jim or Dave, do you want to take that question? Yeah, you know, I, we don't have any, um, if, if you have to use um, uh, fertilizer, then, you know, a natural um, product is, of course, better than, than uh, chemical, but we don't, you know, we haven't gotten into any kind of standards or rules or anything um, at this time on the use of uh, of lawn chemicals. Um, Very, I appreciate it. One one tip. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. One tip uh, that I have. Well, two things. First of all, I use low grow grass seed, and you don't have. To, there's no maintenance to it. Um, as long as you take the leaves off so they don't blow into the lake. There's nothing really, nothing else to do. I haven't mowed the front, the lake front in uh, all year. And it's slower than the back uh, part of the cabin. So that's a tip for people. It stays green, low grow. Uh, you can get it at Feed and Seed, uh, which is where I happen to have gotten it, but there's other places. Next, DNR. Uh, I work with Kelly and Jim on my shoreline and uh, they not only uh, helped me put a pathway in that would, you know, that uh, met the requirements of uh, percolation, I guess you could call it. Uh, but they also helped me design it in a very, very uh, artistic way. Uh, they helped me select plants they referred me to various um, people that where you can buy, ar ar I don't know if they're arborists, but where you can buy the plants and, and plant them. And uh, they came out and checked. Uh, they were out here probably uh, four or five times. Very, extremely, very helpful. Um, so that's a tip for everyone, Joan. Uh, uh, I thought maybe you would want to know that as well. And then, uh, you know, I know our funding is, uh, grants are getting harder to get from the DNR. Do they know our budget? And uh, if so, do they know how much money we raise for milfoil eradication? Um, I, I we don't, uh, yeah, we don't, we don't share our financials with the DNR. Um, so no, I don't think they know. Um, I don't think they're aware of exactly how much money we, we have to spend. Um, so I, and I, to be honest, I don't know if there's uh, any kind of consideration with the DNR that says, oh, well, this is a, you know, a lake that's more wealthy than this lake. So we're going to give them less, less funding. Um, I, I don't think that's really part of their formula that I'm, that I'm aware of. Dave, do you Jim, have any? Could, Jim, could you yeah, discuss the, the, <clears throat> the decisions that the board debated on our level of participation in the grant application though? Uh, because we had to, you know, decide how much share the association would have compared to the grant and in, in seeking those uh, applications uh, yes i can but... about they know about our cost we share with them what the cost is to treat milfoil annually as part of our permit process 
Um, we have a meeting with them in usually January or February where we get together with all the parties, including the tribe and everybody and kind of had put together a management plan for that year. And then as part of that, we'll submit with our application for grant funding what our total costs are projected to be for everything, for mapping, um, we do some um, some testing for uh, milfoil treatment, both dash and chemical. So they know our, what our annual costs will be. But we, yeah, as Jim said, we don't share with them what's in could our, I, you know, on our balance sheet. Could I put in my two cents worth? This is Joan. As we do our grant application this year, there are sections where they ask, um, do we have financial support from elsewhere? And that's a place where we are able to tell that we have uh, worked on uh, uh, asking for donations to help cover our AIS. And that will enhance our grant application. We'll get um, extra points for pointing that out in our application. So this year, uh, I'm going to um, be part of the group when they talk about that. And I think it would be to our benefit to let them know that we have worked on asking our, our property owners for donations to the AIS treatment fund. So yeah, we've yeah, we've always included that on our on our application. And like when Dave did that go that special GoFundMe, um yep. we let him know about that as, as yep. well. So but, so, but, but so, we don't tell them what our balance sheet, what our entire balance sheet is. Well and you know, uh, actually we are not a wealthy lake association. I spent uh I talked to Kelly Nashota at the uh, county this week and I was asking her what other other lake associations are doing and she was telling me about large balances you know really extremely high balances that other lake associations have she said they have some very generous um people that live on their lakes so um you know i think we will definitely continue to ask our property owners for help keeping our lake as healthy as it can be so yes um, that's that's a good thing i was surprised to find out that that you know as lovely a lake as we have uh, that we uh, don't have a super large balance in our account. That's something for us to work towards. Marty, your question. Oh, we talked about the grants for doing these best practices projects. Our board did talk about um, if we could support uh, the DNR pays 75% of the cost up to $1,000 and the property owner pays 25%. And we talked about, can our board um, help the property owners with that excess amount? You know, as we said, we're, we're using our money uh, in the way that would best, uh, I think, support keeping our lake healthy, which one of those things, the biggest factor is our AIS uh, treatments. So we really don't have an excess of funds, we definitely support the best practices projects, but um, we feel a financial insecurity in our board picking up the 25%. There may be places in the county, and that's what I was talking to Kelly Nishuda <laughs> at Sawyer County. I talked to her about that. Um, could we get some help from the county? So um, we definitely will help any property owner that's interested in a best practice, uh, we will help them secure funding if they are unable to come up with that 25%. I certainly would be willing to help them um, see who could support their efforts. Very good. I kind of hijacked that. I apologize. Michael, did you, you said you might have a couple other questions? Go ahead. There's a question in the chat about removing milfoil. If you want, if somebody could answer that one. Sure. I don't know if Dan, are you still with us? You... I can probably answer it too. I think the question was any recommendations for what an individual homeowner can do to remove milfoil from in front of their home? 
Are there any local companies or divers that will clear milfoil? Um, one thing you can do, I mean, if you're, if you're into it, I mean, I, I dive down and pull milfoil myself. I mean, if you try to get it by the roots and do a good job to not break it and spread it, I mean, you can certainly take care of your own shoreline that way. Um, but there are companies that, and Dan or Jim, you can probably chime in, but there are companies that have divers that will clear milfoil, but um, that's a, to do that, I think it's a, per, you need to have a permit from the DNR to do that and then pay, you know, cover the cost. We do do some of that with the DASH. DASH stands for Diver Assisted Suction Harvesting. So that there's scuba divers going down to pull weeds. Um, any other thoughts, gentlemen? Or Joan? Um, no, and you know, the cost of DASH is extremely high, as we pointed out um, in your comparison that it costs what 4700 an acre to treat with chemical and it costs was it um up to twenty thousand dollars if you were going to use dash on an acre yeah it, was that correct yes yes yeah you know it, it's still the dnr loves to see non-chemical treatments and non-chemical efforts well actually these best practice projects also can help keep um, you know, the water healthier. Also, you know, if you have boats going in or out, uh, our efforts to get a webcam to help, you know, as we said, we're taking dash up or taking milfoil out, but also people could be bringing it back into our lake, people on our lake. So all of our efforts are good. Um, but the one that seems to be cost effective is the chemical treatment or you know, individual property owners could uh, try working with their frontage. You know, and I, I'm not one of the one part of that question was our do we know of any local resources? <clears throat> and I'm not aware of any local. Um, there's a you know, we we work with um, a company, I think they're out of Monaco um, that does the dash. I don't know of anybody locally uh, that does uh, hand pulling or um, diving. Um, themselves here in the Hayward area, but there might be, there might be somebody, you know, not, not too far in our, our region that, that could be contacted to, to see about that. But I'd just be real cautious on doing it properly and not having just a bunch of college kids come out and with their swim raft and, you know, dive down and rip up all this stuff, you know, Lakes like Lake Minnetonka and Minneapolis do those kinds of those kind of things, and they they don't result in in a positive uh, outcome for the lake. So that's all I know. <laughs> we have any other questions, Dan? Um. There was uh, a question before about Dash and uh, uh, let's see what, it, uh, can Dash do more harm if not performed 100% properly? And that was from John Bauer. Uh, and um, everything's good and bad. Um, you know, Dash uh, does remove the plant. Uh, and when done correctly and removing the root, it can be successful. Uh, you're always gonna have a little fragmentation of plants uh, when you do DASH. And the company we use uh, actually uh, uh, puts a, a, a floating buoy uh, line around the area where they're, um, where they're actually doing the work to try to limit fragmentation from uh, you know, moving from the area. So uh, DASH is just one tool in our, you know, of available tools uh, to treat uh, milfoil. And uh, it does have a little downside just as chemical treatment does. I think we'd all agree that we, you know, we don't like to dump chemicals that aren't natural into our lakes, but we feel the benefit of, you know, treating these locations is worth the risk of, uh, the, you know, applying the So, so uh, effective when used effectively, 
uh, you know, when performed properly. And as Joan had mentioned, the, the prohibiting factor with DASH is just its expense per acre. Uh, we just cannot, uh, you know, we cannot afford $20,000 an acre, uh, which is what the, you know, it would cost to do an acre of treatment. So um, that's just my comment on DASH. Um, well, and part of that, Dan, too, to um, interject, maybe, you know, when we get DNR funding to score well on a grant, um, the DNR likes to see us use techniques for managing milfoil. You know, if, if it was our nickel and we had to pay for, you know, treating 10 acres a year or seven or, you know, you can understand the costs. And um, in order to do dash to treat 10 acres, it's just not, you know, it's not feasible. Um, so, you know, we're going to continue to, to kind of play within the rules, but um, chemical treatment is just way more effective cost per acre. And, you, you know, you get good results with DASH sometimes, and, and sometimes you don't get all the plants, and same with chemicals. Sometimes you get all of them, sometimes you don't. So just a process. In, in doing, uh, having, DASH as, having DASH as part of our, um, part of our submittal, um, that raises our standing with the DNR and competing for those dollars. So that's why we continue to have a DASH element uh, the last couple of years. Um, so... The DNR likes to see that. So. Another thing the DNR likes to see, um, they were very excited about us uh, trying to get people to participate in these best practices because the milfoil tends to grow better where there's um, soil in the bottom of, of the lake, in the lake shore. It grows better where that sediment has washed down into the lake by doing a best practice that keeps the sediment from going down into the lake, hopefully there is some impact with less milfoil growing, yeah. if you're following that. So they were very excited to hear that, that we were encouraging our property owners to um, implement these best practices around Round Lake, because that would lead to a healthier um, water site and a healthier uh, clean lake bottom True. so that also enhances our grant <laughs> application and it's it's non-chemical it, it it doesn't cost the lake association a great deal of money as i said they're relatively inexpensive relatively easy most property owners could do them Thank you, Joan. So the time is uh, uh, about, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, I just want to have a time check here. Uh, are there any other questions? I don't know if Mike uh, Ablin has others, but uh, since he's had a couple, I would like to uh, perhaps get anybody else's questions answered uh, before we go back to Mike's question. So uh, if anybody has a question, please put it in the chat or raise your hand and we will unmute your mic. Otherwise, uh, Michael, if you have any other questions uh, after uh, we get responses from others, uh, you're more than welcome to ask them. So if no one has an objection, I suggest we conclude this uh, annual meeting for the Round Lake Property Owners Association. I wanna thank everybody who attended the meeting today. We had between 30 and 35 participants. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, this is your opportunity to provide feedback and ask questions directly to the board. Uh, we do try to communicate effectively throughout the year, uh, but by attending this session, this is one of the ways we can you know, talk directly to our members. So thank you for taking the time today. I hope you found our presentation valuable and uh, we will see you on the lake. Uh, have a beautiful afternoon.